let me let you know ahead of time, today will be one of the weirdest sermons I've ever preached. I want to go ahead and put that out there uh, just so you can, you can know where we're heading. Uh, I want to say good morning. Welcome to you guys. Welcome to you guys watching online from wherever that happens to be. Good to have you with us as well. Today, as I said, is going to be one of the weirdest sermons I've ever preached. The title for the message is Join Me in My Struggle. I know it sounds a little ominous. That's okay. Uh, go ahead and get your Bible out. We'll dig into that if we can. Romans chapter 15 is where we're going to be, page 777. Uh, and by the way, that, it's got to be a great message because it's, it's the seventh week in this series and the page for the Bible is 777. It can't hardly help but be a good message, uh, so no pressure and we'll see what happens with that. All right, we'll all know in a minute if that works or not. Um, we're ending the series seven weeks through the back half of the book of Romans where Paul concludes his uh, doctrinal thesis about all the things that God has provided and God has done and therefore in view of his mercy, here's how we should live our life and we're going to end today with one of the weirdest sermons I've ever preached. So, congratulations. You're here for that. Now, it's weird, the title, Join Me in My Struggle. It's weird not because I'm going to do something difficult like cartwheels or something and ask you to join me in that. That would be weird. That would be a struggle. But I'm not doing that. It's weird because of the content and specifically because of one verse. There's one key verse that the whole message really is built around. It's the one verse where this title comes from. We won't get it until later in the message, but that one verse, the Apostle Paul is commanding the Roman church. He's exhorting them. It's not a suggestion. It's not a recommendation. It's not a, if you get around to it. It's a command from Paul, an apostle of God, and the command he gives, well, honestly, I just would never give it. It's not that I don't believe in it. I mean, it's in the Bible, so I believe it. It's, it's just I would never give it because it feels, I don't know, it feels extra to me. It feels like off somehow to me. But it's in context, and it's a command, and it's the centerpiece not only of my message, it's the centerpiece, I believe, of the whole section of Scripture. So the command he gives is clear, it has biblical authority, I would just never give it. And it's not actually really true, because I'm going to give it today, right? It's in the message today, I'm going to build the whole message around it today. So I am going to ask you to follow the command that he gives the Roman church. So I can't say I would never do it, I, I can just say I never have done it. And honestly, that's probably on me. That's probably on me. Uh, but we'll get there in a minute. Now, I know some of you are nervous, so let me take the edge off of that for just a second, if I can, and talk about one of my favorite topics, church signs. I hate church signs. This is a pet peeve of mine. I, I, I have talked enough about church signs over the years that some of you have sent me pictures. Like, you'll be traveling out of town, like, oh, that's tacky. And you'll send me a picture of the, some church sign. I just hate them. I mean, I feel, here's what I feel like. I feel like there's so many people in our world who need Jesus, who will never walk inside of a church building. They're not going to listen to a sermon. They're not going to listen to a podcast. They're not going to read a Christian book. They're not going to listen to a worship service. And yet they're driving past our churches, and we have a message of giving them an opportunity to give them a message without them having to come to us. And sometimes we just pick so poorly the messages we choose. Like we send these tacky, corny, judgmental statements and I just think it's kind of sad, really, right? We could do better. I wish we would do better. Now I know what you're saying. Some, some of you, and you're right. Some of you are saying, you have no room to talk, dude. You have no position to judge anybody else based on the church sign that's out in front of your bill. Like, I know, it looks kind of pitiful. We have no room to talk about that. Uh, is it up there? It's not up there. Oh, good. The screen went out. Fantastic. Um, we are working on a better picture that may or may not be on the screen. And if it is, you'll be able to see it. If not, well... Oh, there you go. That's, isn't it pretty? It's, it's lovely. Okay. We are working on a better option. Go ahead and throw that up there if we can. We're working on a better option. So hopefully you'll see something like that coming soon, which would be great. And then I can go back to making better church signs, which is great. Now, some of the church signs you see, honestly, are pretty harmless. I mean, they're just, you know, they're a little off, but they're... <clears throat> and some are just tacky. You'll, you'll see tacky ones on occasion. But really, in the big scheme of things, I, in the big scheme of things, I, I love how many of them say welcome, by the way. It's like this tacky message, but welcome, you know. But in the big scheme of things, they're not really that, they're pretty harmless, really. I mean, there's a lot of them pretty harmless. Um, um, so there's, there's that. But there's other ones that are not so harmless. There's other ones that are like, okay, that's, that's not helpful. 
And some are so calloused. I mean, they just, now by the way, I gotta admit, that one made me laugh. That's tacky, I'd never put it on a shirt side, but that's clever, it made me laugh. Um, but some are just hateful. I mean, some of the ones I saw, can you imagine putting that on your sign? And I'm assuming that happened right after the tsunami. And then again, it has welcome at the end. Like, come on, you know, we love you. And this is maybe the worst church sign I've ever seen. The division that some of these signs, this was actually from a church in Birmingham where a larger church was putting a campus in a local area and the guy was saying, don't go to the, it was just, some of these church signs are terrible. Now, this may surprise you, but some of the things that bother me about church signs, some of the most bothersome things are among the most common. For instance, this, this church sign came from downtown Nashville. Now, you don't see anything out of the ordinary, so let me zoom in just a little bit so you can see it better. Uh, the pastor of this church is called Very Reverend. Like he's saying, don't just revere me like you revere everybody else. I'm, I'm very reverend. You know, it's just like, really, I don't know. Now, I looked at the website. I blocked that out because I don't want to make an ugly statement about another church. That's all fine. But they have a big staff, and most of their pastors are called reverend. But then this guy, I blocked out his name. He's called the dean and the rector, which that's kind of formal. And he's called very reverend, which I just thought that was interesting, right? Then on his website, they also have higher, like there's an order to it, higher than his name on the website is the denominational guy who's over that church and, and other churches in the area. And he's called the right reverend. Like, are the other reverends wrong? Like, if revering you is wrong, I don't want to be right. I don't know what he means exactly, but, but it made me think, like, that title could work for me. I don't put reverend in my title, but if you're going to put reverend in my title, let's go with that, right? You, you could, like, the wrong reverend. That could, that could work for me. <laughs> if you're going to put reverend in there, let's, let's go with that. So I was actually looking at a lot of church signs this week in the name of research, and I was looking, and I saw one church that called their pastor High Holy Reverend, which has a nice... It furls off the tongue, high holy reverend. But I've always kind of felt like Wellspring is the Island of Misfit Toys version of church, so it's like, that didn't seem right to me. So our team came up with this one for me, which I thought was probably pretty <laughs> helpful. You know, Paul said he was a wretch, so if Paul's a wretch, I guess I could be poor and pitiful. That's fine. Um, I just, honestly, I've just always had a hard time with pastors putting themselves on pedestals. Like, that just really grinds me when a pastor, don't revere me, please don't. Like, I don't care what you call me, but don't call me Reverend. Like, I, I just have a, I'm, I'm opposed to that name. It doesn't offend me. It's just, don't revere, the Bible talks about this. Don't revere me. That's not, that's not right. Now, all that gives you context for where we're going to go this morning. So if you've got your Bible there in Romans 15, I want you to look at verse 14 with me, and this is where we'll start. Romans 15, 14, Paul's ending this letter to the Roman church, and he says, I myself am convinced, brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. Now, this is foundational for where we're going, so stay with me. He's, he's writing to this church. Remember last week, if you weren't with us, you can look at it online. But last week, they were, they were fighting with each other over petty little issues. He's like, you're fighting over in, insignificant issues, and it's causing this division. And he says, I want you to know that you may not be fully convinced that the guy next to you is full of goodness and able to competent. I'm, but I'm fully convinced, he says. Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, under the inspiration of the living God, is seeing people in the church the way God sees the people in the church, the way that God sees us. And Paul, with God's eyes, says, I am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge, competent to instruct one another. I mean, the reality is God sees more in you, in us, than we see in us. Paul is saying to the Roman church, I believe in you. God believes in you. And, and I'm saying to you, Wellspring, I, I believe in you. God and I agree about this. We see more in you very likely than you see in yourself. God can use you to, to change your family, to change your neighborhood, to change your home, to change your workplace. God can start something in you because it's not about you. We believe more in you than, than you see in you. I mean, look at these verses. First Corinthians 12 says, a spiritual gift is given to each of us, not some, but each of us, so that we can help each other. So the Bible here is saying that when God comes to live inside of you, when you give your life to Christ and the Spirit of God comes to live inside of you, an expression of the living God, an aspect of his spirit comes to live inside of you and gets expressed through your life. That's powerful, friends. 
And he does that so that you can help other people. And together, the Bible says, we form together, not individually, but together, when we're all together, when we're unified, as, as Rob was talking about, when we're unified, we represent the body of God himself, Jesus' body. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, for we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, and God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them just as he wanted them to be. That means God has a place for you. He has a place for each of us. I mean, if God has called you to this part of the body, he's got a plan for you here. Whether he's called you from down the street or he's called you from the West Coast, God has a plan for you. It's, it's bigger than your job. It's bigger than your career. It's bigger than the housing market. God has a plan for you in his kingdom. And God believes in your ability to do it because it's about him. And I believe in you as well. And I believe in his ability to work through you to change the world. And I want you to see that. This, found, this is foundational for where we're going. Look at Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3, Paul says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. How many of you have heard this verse before? This is a, a popular verse. We put this on posters and prints and things. It's powerful. The, the Bible here is saying that not only is God able to do all the things you can ask or imagine, I mean, you're not able to do that for anybody in your life. They can ask or imagine you to do more than you can do, right? But God's able to do everything you can ask or imagine that he could do. But he's able to do more than that, and not just more, but immeasurably more. Like there's some adverbs going on here. God is able to do far more than you think he can do. But here's my question. A lot of you have heard this verse. How many of you know what the last part of the verse is? There's, this is I cut it off short. It says, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. God has exceedingly, abundantly great power and he distributes it to the world through us, his church. And he wants you to know he can do more through you than you think he can. Not just more, he can do immeasurably more than all you would imagine that he could do through you. We've underestimated what he can do through us, his church. You know, some of you aren't sure you believe any of this. You're, you're wrestling with faith. I'm so glad you're here to do that. We want to be able to hear to answer questions. And you're not sure you believe any of this. This may all be made up. I want you to know God can do more through you than you think he can. Some of you are on the other end of the pendulum. You are faithful. You've been following God a long time. You're a prayer warrior. You have such amazing amounts of faith. You've also underestimated how much God can do through you. Even though you think he can do a lot more than the rest of us, he can do more than you think he can. We've all underestimated what he can do through us, his church. And he distributes that power through you. God is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that's at work within us. Now get back to Romans 15. Verse 14, we read it a minute ago, says, I myself am convinced, brothers, sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge, and competent to instruct others, instruct one another. Verse 15, yet I have written you quite boldly on some points to remind you of them again because of the grace God gave me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. He gave me the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So Paul is saying, I have confidence in you. I do. I believe in you. You've been gifted by God, and he can do more through you than you realize he can do through you. But God has given me a different role, Paul's saying. And he, he tells us what those are. He, you can look at it right there in verse 15 and 16. He's, he's given the job of proclaiming the gospel of God. He's been given the job of being a minister of the gospel. He's been given the job of boldly reminding them of God's grace. And, and some of us today have those roles. But I want you to notice the two roles, yours and mine, if you will, aren't listed as better and worse, more important, less important. There's none of that. Paul's got a spiritual job to do, and God can do more through him than, than he realizes. And the Roman church has a spiritual job to do, and God can do more through them than they realize. God has empowered both of us. God gets the glory. God does the heavy lifting. God gets the credit. Right? Now we get to one of the things that, that Paul says that I would never say. Verse 17. Therefore, in response to that, I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. 
Uh, the, the English says glory, it really literally means brag. He's bragging on what God is doing through him. I wouldn't say that, but he qualifies it. Verse 18 says, I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done, by the power of signs and wonders through the power of the Spirit of God. So from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. He brags about what God has done through him, but he only brags about what God has done through him. He said, my job, I've just got a job to do. God has given me a job to do. He's given me spirit of God to, to do it. It's to fully proclaim the gospel. And because I know God's making it happen, I can brag about it because God's doing cool things. That makes me nervous, but Paul's right to say it, right? He's in, it's in the Bible. Verse 20. He said, it's always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known. So, so Paul is placing an emphasis here. We've got to catch this emphasis because sometimes the church loses it today. Paul's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he places an emphasis on reaching people who have not yet heard about Jesus. So for Paul, this is not about building big churches. Although they did that in lots of the cities they went to because lots of people came to faith in Christ. This is not about providing lots of programs for long-term Christians to understand more about the Bible. Although they did lots of teaching. Probably far more than we do, honestly. But it was about the gospel. About boldly proclaiming the gospel the news of Jesus to a world so desperately in need of it. The church, not just Wellspring, but the church, I think Paul would say, man, you've got to get out of yourself. You're too consumed with your own stuff. You've got to get out of your own way to see a world that's dying for what you offer, for what he offers. Now we're going to skip the next section. You can read it later, but Paul tells them how he's going to go to Jerusalem and then Rome and Spain. You can read that later. So skip down to verse 30 with me. This is the key verse of the whole deal. Paul says in verse 30, I urge you, it's a command, if you look at the original language, it's a command, imperative. I urge you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to join me in my struggle, that's where the title came from, by praying to God for me. He specifically says, I want you to pray, not just for each other, do that, I want you to pray specifically for me. You know how a pendulum works, right? So a pendulum starts on one side and it swings to the other side. And we use this as a metaphor for how leadership happens because we do this all the time. Something will get kind of extreme on one way and people will sense a need for correction and so they'll pull it back. But it never goes to the middle. It always goes back to the other side. You've seen this in your workplace. You know, a new CEO comes in or a consultant comes in and says, man, you're, you're too far over here. So they swing it back, but they don't just correct it. They go way over here. Now they're doing something. Or you see it in politics. Man, politically, we go like this all the time, back and forth. We never, we never react to one extreme and bring it to the middle. We always react to one extreme and bring it way over to the other side. And then we have to go back again and back and forth. And you see that in the church. A few generations ago, pastors were really respected but there was a real divide between the clergy, and you had to say it kind of like that, and the laity. And they used the, the, they had to put their chin down. I don't know how they, the clergy and laity. There's a real divide. And people in the church said, wait a minute, I don't read that in the Bible. Like, that's not true. This, the Bible says we've been instilled with the Spirit of God too, not just those guys. I can read the scripture for myself, not just those guys. And the world needs Christian doctors and Christian plumbers and Christian accountants. And that's 100% true. Whether God's called you to be a pastor or God's called you to be a, a plumber, God can use you to change the world. That's 100% true. And the church is way too far over here, and we needed to correct that. But when you combine the swinging pendulum effect with some of the church scandals that have been so public in the last 30 years, you find yourself in a spot where pastor is one of the least respected professions in America every year. Usually, I always look at the survey from Gallup or whoever it is, usually we're either right in front of or right behind used car salesmen. Like we're right in there somewhere. And for good reason, I get it. Uh, we've, we've done this to ourselves. Like when I meet somebody new, I try to avoid the question, hey, what do you do for a living? Because I know once I get it out there, they're gonna treat me different and usually put a stereotype on me. And like I've, I've been tempted, I don't think I've ever done it. I've been tempted to say, when people ask me, like to say something like, I, I'm in sales, which is true, right? I'm in sales. Or, 
or to say like I'm in life coaching or I don't, something. Like I don't want to say I'm a pastor because when you say that, like it just changes the whole deal. But here you have Paul, an apostle, talking to a talented, gifted, God-inspired uh, group here in Rome saying God has provided ways of gifting for you to do something to change the world, and he's provided gifting for me to do my part in changing the world, and it's just a different role from you. It's not better or worse, it's not right and wrong, but I need you to honor it. I need you to join me in my struggle by praying regularly for me. Not just for each other, do that too, but I need you to pray for me. And I've been so hesitant to, to talk this way to the church. It just feels off to me. You, know, you may not understand it, or, or maybe you do, but Wellspring, should, you should be, realize how lucky you are to have the staff that, that the church has. Dedicated, hardworking men and women who love the Lord, who, who, who are sold out for the gospel. I mean, they're not in it for the money. They could, they could make more money in a different kind of career. They're, they're not in it for the perks. They walk, work, work long hours. They're not in it for the fame and notoriety. Well, actually, that's not true. They are in it for the fame and notoriety. I mean, it's a pretty big deal. Uh, to be on our staff, you know, that's pretty appealing. All the private jets and such, you know. It's... But Paul would say, I want, you to, I want you to join me in the struggle by praying for those who lead and serve and teach you. And I want to ask you to do, to do that as well. To pray for each other, pray for people in your life, pray for your family, all of that. But I want you also, and it's, it's hard for me to, to say this, but I think it's right out of the scripture. I want to ask you to join us in the struggle by praying regularly for those who boldly proclaim the gospel. Are we better than you? No. Are we more important than you? Certainly not. But is our role unique? It is. And it requires, it deserves, frankly, the whole church's support in prayer. And because I don't want to be that guy... I don't think in 20 years I've ever, I've ever asked for something like this. I don't want to be that guy. The church has made a correction, rightly so, over the last several decades to eliminate the divide between the pastors and the people. And that was a great change. That's a great course correction. But I think Paul is saying here, I, I don't want us to go so far away from this that we go way over here and I need you to help that by honoring those who have given their lives to the service of the gospel and specifically to do it through prayer. Pray for each other. Pray for your families. Pray for your life. But also pray for us as we devote ourselves fully to boldly proclaiming the gospel. You know, this wouldn't have been just Paul, by the way. If you look at the context of when this was written, Paul at that point was traveling with, Paul, with, with a guy named Silas, also Timothy and Luke and Aquila and Priscilla. He always had a team. Men and women who traveled with him and who gave of themselves of their time and their, of their life. And Paul was saying, don't just pray for me, pray for us as we fulfill the mission that God has given to us, just as we're praying for you, as God uses you to fulfill the mission in your workplace, in your neighborhood, in your schools, in your home. Now for context, I always think context is important. For context... Paul, if you don't know Paul's story, you can read in the book of Acts here in the Bible. You can read and get the whole story. But, but Paul did multiple missionary journeys. And he's getting ready to start his third one. That's when he's writing this to the church in Rome. So he did one missionary journey, came back a while, did another one, came back a while. And then he's getting ready to go out on his third one. And he had seen God work before. So he's like, I've done this a couple of times. And I know that God's going to work again because I've seen him do it. And I know that just as I was opposed on the first trip and the second trip, I'm going to be opposed again. So I need you to pray because I know what I'm going into. I mean, you see that context? And, and the importance of that for me is that I can see some parallels to us. You know, my wife and I started Wellspring uh, almost 20 years ago. It, we're, we can see 20 years in the horizon, right? We're not there yet, but we can see it. And I'm reminded of three separate seasons of, of opposition, not necessarily from people, although people are always involved in these things, but it's spiritual opposition, spiritual pushback. Uh, let me describe it this way, some of you don't really know our story. Before we launched, we launched in 2003, we felt major spiritual pushback. If you've never been through a season like that, I don't know, I don't know that I can adequately describe it to you, um, but just, just trust me. I remember saying to our team, we had a very small team at that point. I remember saying to Amy at one point, 
I feel like our names are on whiteboards in dark places, like we're being targeted. And it wasn't because we had done anything. There was a handful of us meeting in rented space, getting ready to rent a, an old elementary school. There's only a handful of us, but, but there was a sense among us, and I think spiritually for sure, that God was going to do something through this little ragtag group that was going to be significant. We felt it. And so the pushback, I think, was oversized for who we were because of what was coming. Does that make sense? Fast forward 10 years, we were building our first building, not this room, but next door, and God had worked through us and in us and to build, a, I think, a great church, healthy uh, 300 or so of us would meet every week at Spring Hill Elementary, setting up and tearing down and doing all the, all the things. And God had used us. You know, Spring Hill's a, a transient community, so a lot of people would move to Spring Hill and then move to Franklin or move out of state or, or whatever. And so a lot of people beyond the 300 that were there had come to Spring Hill, had come to Wellspring, had, had gotten their life changed because of the gospel. Now they're living somewhere else. And, and we had no sense of what was coming, but we felt like God was saying to build this building. Like that was the next step. So once again, you can just feel this spiritual pushback. Again, I don't know how to describe it, if you've never been through it, but it's like our enemy knew that what was coming was more important than what had been, and he was pushing back to try to keep it from happening. If you've never felt it, I don't know how to describe it to you, but I think it, it really happened. And then you fast forward to today, we are in what I've defined as our third clearly defined season of spiritual pushback. Each time, what God did on the backside of that time was more significant than what he had done before. And I believe this is coming again. We went from, from not being a church to being a small church in, a, in an elementary school, major pushback. We went from being a medium-sized church to a larger church in a building, major pushback. And now we're a larger church in a newly remodeled space coming off an unprecedented global pandemic. And I can tell you I've had more sleepless nights and more anxious days than at any other time in my life. Not because anything's wrong. My life is good. The church is good. The church's finances are good. Zillow tells me my house is making more money every month than I am. I mean, <laughs> life is good, right? But it's pushback. It's spiritual pushback. And if you've never been through it, I don't know that I can adequately explain it to you. You just got to trust me. And I'm going to ask you to pray for me. Specifically for me. Pray for each other, but, but also pray for me. Pray for our staff. Those who are leading and teaching and shepherding you through this season. Pray for our elders and our finance team and our life group leaders. Join me in my struggle, Paul says. And I echo that to you. By praying to God for me. By praying to God for us. By praying that the gospel would be boldly proclaimed. I got to thinking about it this week. When I got to this passage, I would have never chosen this section. And yet, it's, it's in the section. It's, it's the key passage, I think, to teach. I don't know in 20 years I've ever asked the church to pray for me because it just feels diva-ish or something. I don't know. Not devious. Diva-ish, right? <laughs> but that's on me. I should have. I should have. And I'm asking now. I want to ask you to, to pray for three specific items. Number one, I want to ask you to pray for the series that starts Sunday. This coming Sunday is Easter Sunday. We're certainly aware of that in our, our planning. Uh, if you're not sure you believe all of this, and I'm so glad you're here, by the way, you're wrestling with faith, you're not sure what it means for you, if it means anything for you, is it all made up? This series would be great for you. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna celebrate Jesus and talk about his death and resurrection, but we're also gonna talk about how in that day, Jesus was hidden in plain sight, but people missed him, and how today he's hidden in plain sight. He's everywhere, you just don't notice it until you see it, and if, and if you aren't sure you believe any of this, this series would be great for you. If you have friends in your life or family that they're not sure faith is for them, this would be a great series for them. Invite them. They will be more likely to say yes for Easter than any other week of the year, and we're planning for that, so invite them. That'd be great. So next Sunday, we're going to celebrate his resurrection. We're going to honor Jesus. It's about him, and we're going to point people to the answer to life's struggles that's hidden in plain sight. So I want to ask that all week long, you'd write this on a list somewhere, and you would pray every day for what God would do when the gospel is presented. I want to ask you to pray for that series. Secondly, I want to ask you to pray for Wellspring. I want to ask, um, selfishly, that you pray for me. 
I want to ask that you pray for our church staff. I want to ask that you pray for our elders. I want to ask that you pray for our finance team. I want to ask that you pray. If you're in a life group, you know, life groups pray for each other, which is great. If you don't have a life group, you need that. You pray for each other. I would ask that everybody in your life group would pray for your life group leader because they're leading and teaching and serving you. Uh, Pray for those on our impact team. You see tons of people serve it every week and more will serve next Sunday. Pray for our students and our children who are, who are facing uh, pushback and trials spiritually such that we never faced as kids. And they're facing it. And we're, we're desperately working with you as parents to, to tether their soul to the word of God so that they can't drift away when culture pushes. And I want to ask that you would pray for them and pray for those who work with them, especially if you have students in the program. Pray for those who are giving their life for your students. Join them in their struggle. Pray for Wellspring. And third, I want to ask that you find ways to pray together. Pray together. If you were to go back a few years in my life, uh, I, I got to a point health-wise where I wasn't in a good, a good place. Um, and so I, I went to a, uh, a local gym that had a lot of coaching. It's kind of expensive, but I went there for six months, and I was regular. I went from not working out at all to regular three times a week. I was there every week, and as early I went, I'd go... And then I quit that gym after six months because it's kind of expensive. And, but a friend of mine, I, I planned ahead of time. I was like, I don't want to get out of this routine. So a friend of mine and I uh, would work out in his, his garage. And I was there at his garage at 5.30 every morning for you know, regulars for, for months, three times a week. Hardly ever missed three times a week. And then he moved out of state. And so I, I thought, I'm just going to keep working out by myself. I'm going to do this. And so I was in my garage, 5.30 in the morning, three times a week, regularly. And then twice a week regularly, and then like once or twice a week, and then once a week, and then once a month, and then today I'm more consistent than ever. My weights don't move and neither do I. Like it's all good, right? <laughs> now, what's changed in my life? Is, is the equipment changed? Is the desire to work out changed? No. Is, is my need to work out changed? Don't answer that, but is my need? No, it hasn't changed. What's changed is together. And if you're praying alone, You're going to get excited for a while and do it, and then you're going to quit. And I'm going to rev you up again, and you're going to quit. And you're going to rev up again. You need to pray together. That's just how we're made, friends. So find ways to pray together. Our elder team, you may not realize this, our elder team has been meeting here every morning at 6 o'clock on the dot to pray for you. If you come in between 6 and 6.30, you'll see three, four, five of them on their face, on their knees, praying for you. Five days a week since the beginning of the year. Some of our staff has been gathering together first thing in the morning, every morning, five mornings a week to pray. Our life group is praying together every week. We have a prayer team meeting right now back in that room. They're praying right now for you, that God would impact you through the words that are being said. They're doing that every morning. It's like the old proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I just want to say to you, if you if you want to get in the spiritual game, You've got to be praying more than you are, and you've got to do that together or you won't last. And I know that full well. So so find people, if you're in a life group, you don't have to be the leader, ring the bell. You be the, the, the yippy dog in the corner saying, hey, we've got to change this, we've got to change this, we've got to pray together, we prayed yet, let's pray together. Like You be that guy to your life group, get them praying together. If you're in some kind of group here, a Bible study, you meet people for lunch, pray together as part of that. Don't, it doesn't have to take your whole time, but pray for people. If you're in a neighborhood, you know there's other Christians. I don't care if they go to our church or not. If there's other followers of Jesus, you're on the same team. Pull them together and pray. You're like, well, nobody's pulling them together. You pull them together. If you're in a workplace and you know there's other Christians, they might not even live in Spring Hill. They don't go to our church. That's fine. I don't care. Pull them together. You're like, well, nobody's getting them together. You get them together. If you do it alone, you're not going to make it. And we're past the moment of all going it by ourselves trying to be good enough people without the power of God. You can't do it. You've got to pray, and you've got to do it together. Now, I don't know what lies before us. I don't. I'm not a prophet. God has not given me any kind of vision. I don't. But I know our track record, and I know what this feels like right now. And I know where our culture's at in our nation and in the world. I know the problems I see on the evening news. And I see how Spring Hill is growing. I mean, God is importing people from all over the country into this city. 
And I just want you to, to, I want you to pray. I want you to join me in my struggle to pray. I, I just got to have it. I got to have it from you. You know, traditionally, we call the church, calls this the beginning of Holy Week. And they call today Palm Sunday. That's traditionally what is called. If you've been in churches, you know that. And they celebrate the story that, that Rob told where the Sunday prior to Jesus' crucifixion and Easter Sunday, the Sunday prior, Jesus rode into the city and people laid down palm branches and they, they shouted Hosanna and Jesus rode in on a donkey. And all that seems very humble to us. We have little kids with the palm branches and donkeys seem kind of off. But that was a political statement of the day. That was a, a leadership statement of the day. Conquering kings rode in on donkeys and they laid palm branches in front of them. Palm was, was the symbol on the the Roman coin of that day. Like they were saying, he is our king now. And they cried out, Hosanna, which means save us. And some of them may have been saying save us spiritually. They may have understood. I think some of them may have realized that when I'm here, when I've come out of my house, out of the, 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 you know, the alleyways at a distance, and I've come into this crowd, and I've said you're the king, I'm now putting myself at odds with Caesar himself and you're going to need to save me. Like, I've gone all in for you, dude. I need you to go all in for me because I'm in trouble. I put my neck on the line for you now because they know I'm part of this crowd. And I think some of them weren't even talking spiritual. They, they may not even realize what was happening spiritually. They were just saying, i got to have you bail me out because I went all in for you. And it was that moment where Jesus put them in a position where you can't nibble around the edges anymore. You can't say, I'm sort of with you, but I'm sort of in the crowd. I'm kind of at a distance. Like Jesus, when he rode in on a donkey and they started laying palm branches, it was a deal where you either had to say, I'm all in. I'm going to push my chips into the middle of the table or I'm out. And you had to pick what you were. And they were saying, hey, just settle them down. They're, they're, going, they're going to cause a stir. And Jesus said, if they shut up, the rocks are going to cry out. Because this is that moment where everybody's either in or out. And I think culturally, friends, we are at that moment. Our world is at that moment where you're in or you're out. And I beg you to put your faith in Jesus who rode in that day, who died for your sins, who rose again bodily uh, three days later and is now the king of the universe. I, I beg you to do that. If you don't know who he is, man, I'd love you to meet him. I'd love to introduce him to you. I'd love to teach you about who he is and you can make decisions for yourself. If you follow him already, beg you to push your chips into that table. There's all kinds of tables you can push your chips into the middle of, and some of us have. Only one of them will satisfy. Only one of them will save the spot our world is in, and the time is coming where you're, you're in or out. And I beg you to give your life to something that matters more than what so many of us do. Join me in my struggle. Let's pray together. God, I ask that you would, you would help us to declare that you are our solution. You are our leader. You're our king. You're our savior. May that be true today through our mouth, through the words we say, through our actions, through our choices, through our lifestyle. You're it, God. We're going from putting one toe in the water to we're all in. Chips to the middle of the table. This is, this is where we're hanging our hat. That this man, Jesus, your son, lived a sinless life. He died a, a horrible death on a Roman cross, but death didn't beat him. He came alive again. And because he's alive, we live. Because he's alive, we can trust. Because he's alive, we can have faith that you're going to work powerfully in our life too. And that you're going to meet us one day when we face death, as he did. You're going to meet us and you're going to usher us through death to the other side. May we make that kind of declaration in our life, in our faith, in our homes, in our communities. Because of what Jesus has done. And we pray together now in his mighty name.